All right, so that brings us actually to the end of the second day of the Encryption Consulting Conference. We've got one more presentation to close off the day and the conference. So our final speaker of the day is one of our very own, so Riley Dickens, a cybersecurity consultant here at Encryption Consulting. Um, please note that our original speaker, Mario Galatovic, was unable to, to, to present as he had a last minute conflict. So our next speaker, Riley, I just wanna tell you a little bit about him. So Riley is a graduate of the University of Central Florida in Orlando. He majored in computer science with a specialization in cybersecurity. He has worked as a consultant with Encryption Consulting for two years, focusing his skills on hardware security module com configuration and implementation, as well as public key infrastructure assessment, design and implementation, and code signing. Please help me welcome Riley. My name's Riley Dickens, and I'm a consultant with Encryption Consulting. Now, today, I'll be speaking to you about my topic, protecting CI-CD pipelines with code signing best practices. So let's get into it. So our agenda today is going to focus on five different topics, starting with attacks on software build pipelines. So we'll take a look at the different challenges you face with code signing, uh, some of the different things that you can use to protect yourself while code signing, and things of that nature. Now, from there, we'll move to NIST 800-218, and I'll explain that in depth once we get there. Next, we'll move to 10 best practices when dealing with code signing and software build pipelines. And then our last two points, we will focus on how our company, Encryption Consulting, can help, as well as why you should use our code signing platform, CodeSign Secure. So, we will start off with attacks on software build pipelines. Now, when talking about different attacks on software build pipelines, there's a lot of costly breaches. And these breaches come from a number of different locations. They can be the cost that you need to pay to pay for the ransomware that's locking your systems. It could be different fines that you might have to pay because after the fact, there has been you know, a, there is found to be a breach of security that you didn't have in place. Um, and it's not only monetary issues or breach costs that you have to pay. It's also brand reputation and credibility loss that comes from prospective customers or current customers seeing that there is a breach and not being as trusting of your systems. <laughs> Now, these cyber attacks have been very prevalent lately, and that's saying any type of attacks, but specifically focused on software pipelines. And it's actually been so prevalent that it's given rise to a new field of cyber insurance. And the emergence of this field really focuses on creating regulatory and class action lawsuits against big corporations that fail to protect sensitive data of customers. So as you can see, the costs aren't only monetary, but they can also cause lawsuits and just bring a whole new breed of trouble to your organization. So that's why we like to focus on being prepared ahead of time before this even becomes an issue. Now, moving to our next slide, we're going to focus on some of the common challenges we see with code signing. And code signing is one of the ways that we find to protect CICD pipelines the best, as well as software and code being distributed to different users and things along those lines. Now, one of the biggest issues or challenges we see with code signing is controlling the signing operations and the processes as well involved in that. And often we see that keys are not securely stored as they should be. So Oftentimes, we'll see an organization use software-based storage as opposed to a hardware-based storage, which software-based storage of keys is a lot less secure than hardware-based storage. Now, going along with that, we also happen to see little or no audit trail that is in place for signing operations. So if an auditor needs to come in post-breach or if anyone honestly needs to come in and follow that path of the signing operations, 
that audit trail is not in place or there's very minimal. And so the it'll be a lot harder to get to the bottom of that attack as well as provide an audit trail. Now, another important point that we see, another challenge with code signing, is organizations having a lack of centralized control and auditing of the signing process. And what I really mean by that is we often see signing events aren't recorded centrally, which is a big issue because you need to be able to go to one location and see everything at once. So that's really important, as is the having a, an approval process in place. So many organizations will see will not have an approval process or a very minimalized approval process in place for executing signing operations. Now, our final challenge that we'll talk about is actually validating the signing process and dealing with the global distribution of your development teams. So many big organizations will face an issue of having their there are different development teams that may be working on different parts of code or different types of code, and that code needs to be signed, but they're so spread out, it's international, inter internationally spread, that they'll find that, oh, well, this organization or this part of the organization is storing keys perfectly, but this part of the organization is not, and that's caused a breach the entire, you know, nationwide for our organization. So it becomes really, really complicated to handle the management and get that visibility that you need into your different development teams, especially when they're spread that wide. Now, additionally, we also see a lot of a lack of controls in place, and that goes along with that spread of the development team, where you might not be able to keep track as closely as you'd like to of that development team because they're so far away. So these are some of the common challenges we see when organizations are facing code signing or taking a look at their code signing operations in place currently. Now we'll take a little deeper dive into this NIST 800-218. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, the NIST or the National Institute of Science and Technology creates a number of different documents and they tend to focus on cybersecurity. So they aren't a specific guide that you have to follow to be compliant, but they have a number of researchers working on this constantly, and they'll produce these different recommendation papers like this one that will advise businesses on best practices or recommendations that they suggest to be the most secure. And so with with attacks happening often, like, like these workflow and CICD pipeline attacks, this NIST 800-218 was released. Now, this focuses a lot on the software development life cycle. And so what this, what this document does is it advises businesses to do a number of different things. And this includes ensuring staff procedures and tools are ready to carry out a safe software development. And what I mean by that is you need to have the right team members that are background checked, that are safe and can be trusted to work in this software development lifecycle. You need the proper tools that aren't just a sketchy third party tool that you might be using, but an accredited one that may also be signed itself if it's a software based tool and things of that nature when looking at building your software development uh, your software development life cycle. Now, additionally, this paper also notes that preventing unauthorized access and tampering with any programming components is very important. And so it's really, really vital to make sure that only those who need access to your different programming components or the software itself have that access. And that makes sure that, you know, there's no issue of oh, well, someone from finance is reaching out to our code and making changes, and that shouldn't be the case. Now, two other parts of this document that are very vital are the that the creation of software should be very secure, and any security flaws in its releases should be minimal to none. Now, this seems pretty obvious, but it's very, very important because a lot of different infections of organization's customers in recent attacks have come from 
a security flaw that is exploited within software that's released. So it's very important to not only make sure that your systems are secure and have the least amount of flaws possible, but it's also important to identify and make take the necessary action to change those flaws as soon as they're found. You don't want an issue on a piece of software you release to be sitting there for months or even years and being exploited that whole time. And then you've got customers who across years have been infected because of this issue you introduced into their environment. So it's very important to make sure that whole process is secure, as well as making sure those vulnerabilities are taken care of very quickly. So now that we've looked at some of the general beginnings of this topic, we'll take a look at some of the 10 best code signing practices we suggest when dealing with code signing in software delivery. Now, the most obvious and the first best practice is controlling and minimizing access to private keys. And one of the biggest security risks we see is that organizations will insecurely store their different private keys or code signing certificates. And that key or code signing certificate will get taken and then it will be used or misused, I should say, by a, a bad actor, a threat actor. And that way they can take that private key that is confirmed from your PKI systems and they can create code, sign off on it with that private key or that code signing certificate, and it looks as if your corporation released it. So it's extremely, extremely important to keep your private keys safe, whether that be with a, a device that you may attach to your computer to store it or a hardware security module, anything like that that securely stores your keys is very important. Now, regarding this, um, it is, our, our suggestions are allowing any access to private keys or certificates that that be done with the minimal number of computers or users needed. So this is similar to what I spoke to earlier, where you want to have the least amount of people that need access with access. So that way, it's a smaller number of people that you can say, OK, these five people have access to this key. It makes it a lot easier to track where an issue may come from and who may have lost that key. Now, going along with this, we also have that access to private keys should be only given to authorized personnel. So along a similar vein to the previous one, this is focusing on making sure only authorized personnel have access to whatever type of device or, or wherever you may store private keys. So it should only be background checked, very trusted personnel. You shouldn't have any third parties being able to reach these keys. You shouldn't have any, you know, contractors coming in and having access to these keys. It should only be trusted and authorized personnel. Now, finally, and this may seem a little obvious, but it's still just as important, is having actual physical security measures in place. So that includes safes where you might store your passwords or a locked cage that you might have your PKI or your HSM in that stores the keys. Um, any number of physical, you know, badge access that that's included in physical security measures. So anything along those lines is very important to keep your whole infrastructure safe. Now, moving to our next best practice, this is very similar to one of the points I just brought up, actually. And this is our advice to use cryptographic hardware items that will really securely store private keys. And specifically here, we're really focused on hardware security modules or HSMs. And these devices are used to, as you can see in the image here, you may have a cryptographic operation such as signing a certificate or signing software that you would send that request to the HSM. The HSM would ensure that that user or computer is able to use the private key it's trying to sign with. Once that's confirmed, the private key never leaves the HSM and the document or software is signed and sent back with just the signature on it. So in that way, you keep your private key in an isolated environment without having any transfer of the key back and forth that may cause issue of 
a man in the middle attack or any number of different attacks that might steal that key in transit. Now, regarding utilizing different cryptographic hardware items, uh, it is better to have it's better to have a cryptographic hardware device that doesn't allow exportation of private keys to software because as i mentioned previously software based storage is a lot less secure than hardware based so it's important to have that along with using products that are fips certified so in this case hsms tend to be fips 140-2 level 3 certified but if you can find something that's a little stronger than level three, that is preferred as well. You want to have the most security, but you also want to have the most flexibility that you have so that you feel you're secure, but you can also utilize the different functions of your software development lifecycle without feeling hindered by that security. But having a FIPS 140-2 level three certification is a great way to have customers know that keys are secured. Now, speaking of these HSMs, they are a large device, usually kept in a rack in a data center, and they are very difficult to get a key from. There's tamper evident events that occur. If it's moved, it'll wipe the HSM of all the content. So you'll have to use a backup to get it back. So it's a great way of storing keys because you would have to physically get to the device to steal any keys from it since they never leave the HSM. So it's a very secure hardware device to use. <clears throat> so moving to our third best practice, we have time stamping. And this is time stamping in regards to signing code. So it's very important, it's a very important feature that really aids in the verification of code signing. And what's so important about this is it really gives conclusive evidence that software was legitimate and signed at a legitimate time when it was sent to the user for download. So what I mean by that is you may use a certificate to sign code or a key to sign code, and that code will also have a timestamp next to the signature. Now, someone who receives the download may look at it and say, okay, Today is October 10th and the time is 1015. And this was timestamped two days ago with a valid certificate that's still valid. And so it, they know, okay, this is a this has been timestamped and it's been signed. So I can verify that, okay, I can trust this. It's still a valid certificate, or at the time of download, it was a valid certificate and signing. So you know in that case that your code is able to be downloaded and used. And it really makes things a lot easier for customers to see that timestamp because it is associated with the certificate authority that in, in that way you can have, you know, even more than just the, the chain of certificates telling users that, okay, this is safe and this is okay to download and use. Now, to kind of put it another way, timestamping is seen as one of the best practices for code signing because it allows you to check your code even after the certificate is expired or anything along those lines. So what I mean is if someone got a download and the certificate expired later on and they looked back and they wanted to download the software, they could see the timestamp and the certificate date. They can tell between the two that when they got the download, it was okay to download because and use because the certificate hadn't expired yet. So in that case, even though the certificate is now expired, they can still use that code because at the time of delivery, there was no issue with that. So you can see timestamping is a really important part of code signing and making sure your software development lifecycle is very strong. Now, moving on to our fourth point, we have authentication of code. And this is a really big one, especially if you're releasing code out to customers. And this is focused on before you sign your code, actually making sure that code is has not been tampered with, has no malicious you know, malware or insider threats that may have put something malicious in there. It is just a, it is exactly what you expect and you wanna be sure of that before signing any code. And the reason for that is because 
once you sign code, you're signing off that it's legitimate and you're putting your corporation or organization's name on it. And so in that case, if it turns out you didn't check or authenticate the code, then a bug or a malicious payload may be released to tons of customers and you take the fall for that. So focusing on the verification of the code before signing, we'll take a look at different ways you can do that. And uh, undergoing an authentication before it's signed and released, like I said, is very important. And a way to do that is to kind of create a really distinct and and strong uh, approval process. So that may be having your manager sign off on it or having code review or anything along those lines, in which case your, your superiors or maybe someone who does the same job as you, who can be trusted as well, can take a look and make sure that the code is what it says it is and there's nothing hidden within there. So code review is a great way to do that along with a, an approval workflow in place. Now, finally, my last point on authenticating code is that for incident response or auditing purposes, all code signing operations should be recorded. So this goes back to that lack of centralized management of signing events. And here I'm bringing up that you really should record all signing events. That way, if there is a breach, you can trace it back. If there isn't a breach, but you want to find out, you find code that you're authenticating and you say, okay, this has a malicious payload in it. Let's trace it back through all these submissions for these submissions for signing and find who put that in or where this malicious payload may have come from. So this is a great way of keeping track of everything in one place that you can so that you can trace it before or after an attack may occur. Now moving to our fifth best practice, we have scanning it for viruses. And this is very similar to our previous one, except this one is a full full scan for different viruses or malware that may be within this. So this would be done to verify that every line of code has been examined and there's no malicious payload, malicious malware, anything like that in place that could infect your customers. And one great way of doing this is QA testing which is a great way of making sure there's no defects or issues along those lines, as well as using different virus detection software. So in that case, you could have the virus scanner check through the code, you could have code review look through the code, and you could have your QA testing all check the code. And in that way, you can be certain that there's no malware, there's no viruses, you're not introducing anything malicious into a customer environment. And these are just a number of different ways you could do that that could be combined or on their own would do a good job of doing that. Now we'll move on to number six, which is not overusing a private key. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what I mean by that is you may release a lot of software a year, or you may release patches constantly throughout the year or across a number of years. And if you use the same code signing certificate for say five years, then that becomes an issue because somewhere within those five years, that key could have been compromised, whether it's with your knowledge or without it. And it could be being used for other purposes as well for signing. So if you just have one key and one certificate that you're using to sign code across a, a long stretch of time, that's a big issue. So although modern cryptography does seem like it's difficult to crack, that doesn't mean it's impossible to crack. It's, there's still a risk there. So these different keys can be stolen from a number of different ways. So that's why it's really important to, to rotate these keys so that you don't use the same key over and over again. You revoke certificates which invalidates their use for signing, which is very important if you're going to switch to a new certificate. And also as a note, it is important to know that if you do lose a private key, you'll have to revoke the certificate anyways. So it's very important to just cycle different certificates for code signing, different keys for code signing, just so you don't fall into that trap of overusing and having someone steal it without your knowledge and then them using it for malicious purposes. 
Now we'll move to our seventh best practice, which seems pretty obvious, but it's still important to bring up. And that's dealing with tampered certificates. And no matter how you find out a code signing certificate or any other type of certificate has been tampered with or compromised, it's, it's important to revoke that certificate immediately. And notifying your certificate authority or your PKI in general, it's, it, it's, that's very critical because if you waste any time in doing that, they could sign a number of different software, software packages with malware in it or anything along those lines. So the less time you give them to work with a tampered certificate, the better. And that just makes it even stronger if you use certain processes that automatically track uh, certificates or if you have your approval processes in place properly, you can quickly find tampered certificates and revoke them immediately. Now, moving to number eight, we have again coming up is our centralization of code signing. And I know I've gone over this a number of times, but I'll really, you know, bring up some important points here. And so since you have such largely distributed development teams in most organizations, it becomes very important to have everything recorded in one place. That way there's there's a way to look into every part of the organization, no matter where they are regarding their code signing practices, immediately in one spot. So whether that be for auditing purposes, whether that be for uh, just tracking, you know, certificates, making sure that they're still safe, making sure there's no issue with that, it all is very important to have in one place. Now, different technologies that can help you with this and managing certain tasks are also important. Things like having automatic certificate generation, uh, certificate renewal, or tracking code signing certificate expiration dates is very important in your software lifecycle. And what I mean by having these automated processes is say you have someone manually checking every certificate within an organization for the expiration date. That becomes a very big issue if you have a person or a team working on it because it introduces that human error. But if you can set up these automated tasks to go off at the proper times or to properly track certificate expiration dates, then you really won't have any human error or any issue uh, getting rid of those certificates or revoking them and renewing them again once they're expired. So it really makes things a lot simpler and a lot easier to keep track of as opposed to having a human introduce some human error into the certificate lifecycle. Now, moving to point number nine, this is dealing with kind of preparing for the future. So having a very flexible and agile environment for code signing is really important. And what I mean by that is you need to be very adaptable. Your organization should be able to adapt and adopt certain cryptographic algorithms if they become, if old ones become irrelevant or deprecated, then you want to be ready to move into the new one. Or say, I'm sure you've heard a lot of talk of quantum computing. If one day, a lot sooner than expected, quantum computers, you know, become a reality more than they are now, then you really want to make sure you have those strong algorithms in place. You want to be quantum secure ahead of time, or you need to be able to adapt to that quickly. So it's really important to have this flexible and agile environment for your code signing. Now, our final point is dealing with something that might be a little more out there, but that's dealing with key storage devices and keeping those devices safe. And what I mean is you may have a fob that'll keep your private key secure, or you might need to log into your network or, you know, sign certain documents, but you want to keep it on a secure device, a handheld device. Well, in that case, you need to make sure that that device itself is secure as well. And this goes back to having those physical safeguards in place for keys at all times. So say you have a certificate on you know, a secure device and you need to plug it into your computer every day. You want to ensure that that device itself, once it's done being used, is stored in a locked, in a locked safe or a locked drawer 
just something to add an extra layer of security that an intruder or an attacker might have to get through to even get to that device itself. So it's just really important to keep all key storage devices and all keys secure at all times. So now that I've gone on about our 10 different best practices, um, I'll talk to you really quickly about how encryption consulting itself can help. And what I mean is we are we have a platform called CodeSign Secure, which is exactly what we're talking about here. It has high performance software that really works with these different devices, like I've mentioned, hardware security modules, which have a highly efficient execution rate and store keys extremely securely so that you know your private keys are kept safe. They never leave the HSM. All signing is done on the HSM. And it really gives you that, that strength of knowing, okay, my private keys are secure. And so our code signing process is secure. And going along with this, Code Sign Secure focuses on restricting access only to authorized users. And any, any management of keys is done on these hardware devices, these hardware security modules. So you don't have to worry about it being stored on a computer in a software-based storage system and that causing any type of issue for you know, a threat actor getting onto your computer. Even if they do, they still would have to get it from the HSM, which is not possible. Now, with our HSMs, we do focus on an integration with a number of leading hardware security module vendors. And we are we work really well with them. We can integrate with any type of HSM you may need. So CodeSign Secure is a very flexible solution for anything you might need. <clears throat> Now, going on to a little bit more about Code Sign Secure and why you should use it, we'll just touch on a few different parts. And starting off, we'll talk about managing private keys. Now, like I said, managing private keys is done with our hardware security modules. And that means that we have a hardware device that keeps your keys secure. There's no hassle with interacting with the HSMs since we have proxied access to the code signing clients. And additionally, these hardware security modules all have that different, that FIPS 140-2 level three certification standard. So that means that you can feel safe in your private keys being stored there. And as you can see, you need to have a way of reaching the code sign secure server through different things that I'll go through on the next slide, but things like MFA or you know, a key, anything like that, that will recognize it is you going to the code sign secure server. You then need to have access to the key you're trying to sign with, which is on the HSM. Then once it's confirmed that it's you and you do have access to that key, the code or the document will be signed on the HSM. And that signed document or code will come back to you on your device. So it's really important to have that HSM in place because it not only keeps your keys secure, but a big part of the process secure as well. Now, moving to our security features, like I mentioned previously, we have a number of different state-of-the-art security features that will really make sure that the authentication process is very strong between your computer and the HSM. So things like this include client-side hashing, multi-factor authentication, device authentication, as well as quorum and multi-tier approver workflows. And this, this approver workflow is really focused on making sure that if you have a certain environment that needs approval before any signing can be done on software in that environment, then you need to make sure you use either a quorum-based approval process or a multi-tier approval process where potentially your boss and your boss's boss need to sign off before any code that you send out is confirmed to be allowed to be signed. So these are just some of the security features we have in place that make it a really secure environment for authentication. Now, finally, we have our client-side hashing. And with our client-side hashing and signing mechanism, it really makes it 
feel a lot safer and it is a lot safer because less data travels across your network. So in that way, it's a really highly efficient code signing system that transfers data, yes, over to the HSM, but it's less data than normal. And it's a lot more secure because of all these authentication procedures and the security of the HSM itself. So you can rest assured that your data is safe in transit, as well as your data being safe during the signing operation. And that's everything I have for today. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer your questions after. And if you have any information that you'd like to know from me or to learn more about Code Sign Secure or encryption consulting in general, feel free to reach out to me. Here's my email, my phone number on this slide. Um, and yeah, just reach out to me any day or time. I'm happy to help. So thank you all. Great. Thank you, Riley. Thank you so much for that presentation. Of course. Thank you. Of course, thank you. Great. I see we've got Panit here. Um, Riley, I've got some questions for you um, from our audience. So let me start with the first one. Could cyber insurance be customized for high risk or low risk applications for the goal of reducing costs for security? So yes, that can be used for both. It can be trimmed down for whether you have high or low risk. Um, but it doesn't mean it's similar to having car insurance where, yes, you have car insurance, but you still shouldn't be reckless with your car. So similarly, you can have your cyber insurance and feel a little more secure with that. But that doesn't mean you should let your security of your customer or user data uh, fall behind. So it's still very important to keep up your security. Right. Um, is there a threshold where it becomes necessary or unnecessary to sign events during operations? I would say no. Um, I, I believe it's very important to sign all code or anything that may be going over to, you know, a user or a different client, anything that's basically going to be used that you are putting your company's name on. It's very important to have your signature there so that they can rest assured that, you know, this wasn't tampered with, this is secure software and, you're backing it by signing it. So it is really important to keep signing everything that you send out. So so all actions should be in a list of evidences. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. What are some examples of useful tools for the code authentic authentication process, software, formats, et cetera? So different things are available. There's a lot of MFA. So you might have different apps that uh, give you your, you know, your authentication or things like that. And just using tools that have everything built in similar to Code Sign Secure, where you can make sure everything's being authenticated as it goes through and as you're sending data around to different devices or things like that. Okay. Panit, anything to add to uh, to Riley's presentation and, and encryption consulting's um, offering? I would say <coughs> Riley has covered everything. I don't have anything to add on that. So I think he has covered everything on his okay. presentation. Yeah. Well, great. Well, Riley, thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. You were the last presentation of the second annual Encryption Consulting Conference. So, so great to close it with an encryption team member. Um, Pini, what's your, what's top three takeaways from the second annual Encryption Consulting Conference? So the top three takeaways would be that uh, I would recommend that uh, all my customers to do at least one annual assessment for their uh, data production, uh, data production, uh, like a current state uh, details. The second would be that, as Radhi was mentioning, that code signing is pretty important and there are a lot of attacks happening nowadays because companies are not following the proper processes or uh, they're not controlling the keys of the code signing to have the, so do sign your code and have the, uh, granularity or the audit uh, audit trails in place so that uh, nothing get compromised. And the third takeaway would be that keep on learning and keep on enhancing the security posture of your company and organization. Riley, anything to add? What's your top takeaway from the second co annual conference? I think uh, thinking about future state as well with quantum cryptography and things like that coming into play, I think that's also very important to pay attention and, you know, uh, pay attention to any stories about it as, as things get updated with quantum cryptography as well. Okay. 
Well, thank you guys. That concludes uh, the second day of the second annual encryption consulting conference. Um, we really want to give a really big thank you to Talis and Juna and Protegrity for supporting this event and for you guys for um, attending, watching the sessions. Um, we are recording all the sessions. We have recorded all the sessions. They will be available on demand. So um, we are going to be sending out an evaluation. Really uh, value your feedback in what you thought of the last two days and the sessions. And then also what topics um, do you want to see at the next, the third annual encryption consulting conference? So please keep in touch with us. Keep keep in touch with us and thank you. See you next year.